All right, so our next talk is Tommy Thomas, who's going to talk to us about press. Um, it's one of the neurologic complications. We have three good talks now coming on about neuroscience and critical care. So Tommy, I'll hand it over to you and let you go from there. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Tommy Thomas, and I'm here to discuss the wonderful syndrome of press, the who, what, and the when. Um, so first for a clinical vignette, um, there's a 44-year-old who has a history of metastatic renal cell carcinoma with status post to bulking and uh, subsequent recurrence. Um, he was on um, chemotherapeutics for his, uh, for his disease, and he suddenly presented um, uh, after being noted by his family to have a headache, uh, some fatigue, word-finding difficulties, uh, some fluctuating mental status, um, and including an inability to recognize his family. Um, also of note, on pre presentation, his blood pressure went from uh, his usual of 130 to 140 over 70s to 80s to a new blood pressure of 160s to 100s. Um, he got an MRI, and on his MRI you'll note that he has these posterior, not necessarily anteriorly, posterior um, lesions, predominantly white matter, um, that extending anteriorly and posteriorly uh, throughout his brain, only on two T2 uh, flare, not really involving the cortex, as you see right here. Um, so uh, that leads us directly into, what is this? Um, so first, we're going to talk about press. Um, I'll define it for you, give you some of the pathophysiological uh, high points of it, um, talk about its clinical presentation, um, its diagnosis, and we'll discuss some treatment approaches after that. So uh, to define press, um, it actually has a pretty terrible name. So posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. Um, it's got a number of different aliases, hyperfusion encephalopathy, um, my favorite brain capillary leak syndrome. Um, it was codified as a syndrome from a small case series in 1996, from a case series of, series of about 12 to 15 patients that, that presented with this. Now to further define press, um, it's really a clinical radiological entity. Um, you need a com combination of a suggested uh, clinical manifestation as well as a defining radiological criteria, which we'll, which we'll talk about momentarily. Now, the reason I said PRESS was a terrible name is because PRESS, posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. It's not always posterior, and it's actually not always reversible. And we'll discuss uh, the reasons for that and some of the things that, that, that lead to that in a, in a few moments. But uh, there's some discussion of, of why we even named it PRESS. So briefly, the pathophysiology of PRESS. Um, this is under some debate as well. So there are two prevailing theories. One of those is a hyperperfusion theory, and one of those is a hypoperfusion theory. Um, in the first one, uh, you have, you have uh, hypertensive emergency, uh, a number of other conditions, which we'll also talk about, that, that affect your uh, brain basement membrane, blood brain barrier integrity. Um, this hyperperfusion leads to uh, leakage and subsequently uh, vasogenic edema. Now, as for the hypoperfusion, there are a number of conditions, which again we'll also talk about, that do the same thing through a very different, different mechanism. Uh, they, through cell cytotoxicity, uh, induce the same blood-brain barrier leakage, and ultimately you end up with the same uh, radiographically pathognomonic vasogenic edema. Now, as far as that, as far as that goes, why, why uh, we're going to, we'll talk about it, but um, all of these conditions, we see toxemia in pregnancy, eclampsia, um, post-transplant, um, autoimmune, um, chemotherapeutic agents, all of these lead to, the, lead to that, that cascade through either one of those two methods. Um, one, one note that I wanted to highlight that's important, and that's a bit confusing. This slide is deliberately a bit confusing because this, this is also one of the confusing things about press. Hypertension. So patients with chronic hypertension are um, at an increased propensity for development of press. Um, but Notably, patients who are not even hypertensive but have an acute change in their blood pressure also have a higher association with PRESS. Um, we see that hypertension is also all, often present in PRESS uh, with 60, 67 to 80% of the patients that present having hypertension. Um, but it's not a very good indicator of whether the patient actually has PRESS. 
And what is a better indicator is that there's a relative increase from the patient's baseline uh, systolic blood pressure or MAP uh, to the one that they currently have. Um, this is because this rapidly overwhelms the autoregulatory mechanisms of the cerebral blood flow, which ultimately leads to that leaky blood-brain blood barrier uh, uh, membrane. So let's talk briefly about the clinical presentation. So just as, that, as in our vignette, um, patients often present with consciousness impairments. Um, they're confused, they have coma. Um, one of the things that approximately 80 to 90 percent of the patients have is some sort of seizure activity. Um, headaches, visual abnormalities, mostly because of the predominant uh, effects of press in the posterior regions, nausea, vomiting, focal ne neurological signs that, that make press resemble stroke. They can have uh, signs on weakness on one side or another, numbness and t tingling, etc. Now the differential diagnosis is, is a fairly lengthy one because um, even with the pathognomonic uh, radiological signs, there, there are a lot of things that can resemble press and there are a lot of things that can present that way. But as you'll see when we discuss the radiographic signs, press, press is, is fairly easily defined on, on imaging. So discuss that neuroimaging first. So your, your patient presents to the ED or to the hospital and more often than not, the patient is going to get uh, a head CT more rapidly than they're going to get an MRI. Um, usually on that head CT, you'll see areas of kind of ill-defined hypodensity um, in a variety of different, different regions, usually posterior, but again, not always. Maybe the pointer is failing. Um, but again, not always. Um, that lead you to suspect press. Um, these are unique hypodensities because they don't follow a vascular distribution and, and they could represent a number of different things. Um, so in order to d diagnose press, uh, you need to subsequently get an MRI. And the, there are several patterns on an MRI that are definitive for, for press. Um, so press has about four, four patterns. One is the holohemispheric watershed pattern. Uh, again, you see posterior involvement, but you see sparing. Here, we'll use this. You see sparing of the of the cortex again, and the sparing of the cortex is interesting because it really happens because the cells in the cortex are more tightly packed than the cells are in the white matter. So when there is leakage of fluid, the fluid has a propensity to um, uh, aggregate in the white matter tracts. Uh, again, you see this, this posterior predominance here, um, and you see some anterior and watershed uh, pattern. Um, again, here's another pattern, superficial frontal sulcus pattern. So this is, you have still some posterior, and the reason that you usually get posterior involvement is because the autoregulatory mechanisms for cerebral blood flow in the posterior circulation are, are worse than those in the anterior circulation, meaning that the anterior circulation can handle higher pressures than the posterior circulation. So again, you see this uh, white sparing of the cortex, um, white matter flare signal uh, uh, hyperintensity. You see a d dominant parietal pattern, which is, again, you have posterior involvement here, um, again, sparing of the cortex, and then there's the hodgepodge, which is a combination of, of all of the different patterns um, or, or none of the patterns. It's a unique expression with sparing of the cortex and um, with T2 flare uh, hyperintensity. So in order to define and diagnose press, you really need an MRI. Uh, the CAT scan you can do, and if you have limited resources and, and can only do CAT scan, you can do one CAT scan and follow up in several days if the clinical syndrome is representative. Uh, but first, you must rule out all of the other possible etiologies that we discussed uh, in the differential diagnosis that could potentially uh, cause press. Um, now, some of the things that you see that complicate um, the outcomes from press and are complicated at the time of diagnosis, you can see cerebral ischemia in some, some, almost a quarter of some of the patients that have press. Some of those patients also have hemorrhage. Uh, this hemorrhage is also uh, secondary to that cascade that caused the leaky base, basement, member, basement membranes uh, and the cytotoxicity subsequently leads to cell apoptosis and death and then ultimately you can see cerebral herniation from the swelling and edema. So let's talk briefly about the treatment approaches. Um, I have a couple of algorithms here uh, that may be hard to see, but 
Um, basically, this is the radiographic algorithm, and it just discusses uh, the use of CAT scan early on uh, if you can't get MRI, and then subsequently the use of, of MRI. Um, what's left out here is how you have to rule out the differential diagnosis. And most of the patients end up in the ICU um, because of the focal neurological sim symptoms, coma, uh, and seizures. A lot of them will require ventilatory support early on um, while, you're, while you're trying to figure out the causative etiology of PRESS. To discuss that a bit more, after you de define PRESS and after you've diagnosed it, uh, then the things that you need to treat, first you need to treat the seizures, um, and patients such as eclampsia and PRESS have a lot of overlap because, because they're both, both basically um, leaky syndromes that cause edema. One of them uh, is known to be cytotoxic, the other has a multiple, multiple different etiologies being pressed. Um, but treating the inciting uh, etiology is key to actually treating press. So treating the seizure, treating the hypertension with, with drips, um, treating the seizure with anticonvulsants or benzodiazepines if, if necessary uh, in order to stabilize the patient and uh, ultimately to improve outcomes. So to touch on outcomes briefly, um, early treatment is really the, the key in successful treatment of PRESS. Um, usually you'll see complete reversal of even the radiographic symptoms uh, or syndrome signs uh, in several days, five to seven days after the diagnosis of PRESS. Now, death has been reported in approximately 15% um, or as high as 15% uh, given the case series. And that's usually confounded or caused by um, patients who have delayed diagnosis, uh, stroke when they're at the time of their diagnosis, uh, who progress on to intracerebral hemorrhage and cerebral edema, which subsequently results in their herniation. So to summarize briefly, um, press, um, terrible name, but that's what we have. Um, so you have to suspect and diagnose it early in order for uh, you to have high success in treatment. Um, identifying those causative etiologies is going, going to be key um, because some of them have different treatments than others. Um, for instance, treating severe hypertension or treating just the change in the patient's blood, uh, baseline blood pressure is going to be key to reversal of the radiographic signs and symptoms of PRESS. Uh, again, you're going to have to treat the seizure and control seizures and continue other supportive care. All right. I think that's all I have. Any questions? <laughs>